good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those of you who are on the uh, on the uh, East Coast, uh, good afternoon. My name is David Failing. I'm the uh, new business development director for Lucas Diesel Systems. And I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of Lucas to welcome all of you to this first in a series of Lucas sponsored webinars. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we go much further. In order to reduce uh, distractions for everyone, we have muted your microphones and we've also uh, muted your, your video. So you cannot see each other, but uh, like that we have uh, a lot less distractions. We'll be saving time at the end of this presentation today uh, for all the, uh, the questions that you may have, and we'll try and answer as many as, uh, as we can. Uh, I would suggest that you please place your uh, questions in the uh, Q&A, which if you move your mouse or your cursor, you can see that at the bottom of your screen, more or less in the middle, there's uh, an item that says Q&A. If you click on that, then you can type in your questions, and that's the way we will be addressing your questions. And as I say, we'll get to as many as we can, uh, given, uh, given the time that we have. And now a little bit about our webinar and our presenter. Our presenter this afternoon, as you can see, is Tony Salas. Uh, Tony is instructor with Power, Powertrain Training. Tony Salas has been teaching classes nationwide for over 35 years. I didn't know that, Tony. That's quite a, quite a history there. He is currently the course instructor for Powertrain Training, and he specializes in light and medium duty diesel applications. His instruction focuses not only on product specific, but use of diagnostic tools, service information, and critical thinking needed to take on diagnosis and repairs on today's trucks. He's worked as an instructor for General Motors Fleet and AC Delco. Additionally, he's done contract training for Motorcraft, Standard Motor Products, Delphi, and many independent shops. He is the former training manager for the Association of Diesel Specialists as well. His knowledge base encompasses diesel, and automotive gasoline applications. This includes electronics training and networks. Tony works on automotive and light and medium duty diesel vehicles on a daily basis, which enables him to teach up to date real life scenarios to help the technician diagnose and repair with much more accuracy. Powertrain training provides hands-on training at their location in Las Vegas. Powertrain training is to a training provider which also operates a light and medium duty diesel service and repair facility. And that's where, as, as I said earlier on, Tony gets all his expertise from, from working on present day vehicles. The webinar subject today is on the big three, which is the Ram Cummins, the Power Stroke, and the Duramax. He'll also cover issues he has found on all of these trucks. There will be a discussion on fuel trim, common rail diagnostics, intake issues, and the latest in after treatment. He will also cover issues with NOx sensor one diagnostic trouble code sets. These webinars are intended to enhance your skills and give you updates you may need in your drive-in facility and in your shop. Tony will use diagnostic scenarios and use of service information. So it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Tony Salas. Tony, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. David Failing. Thank you very much. Welcome all to our Lucas sponsored uh, <coughs> webinar. And there's a lot to discuss. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my, uh, my presentation up here. Um, first of all, uh, once again, thank you for Lucas for sponsoring this uh, webinar. A uh, lot going on with diesel, obviously, uh, you know, you, uh, every day that I have my phone on, it's always an adventure, not to mention when I get to work at the shop, that's another adventure. The phone calls are just overwhelming sometimes in terms of knowledge, um, but hopefully you'll get some information out of this that will help you with your diagnostics. It seems like every day I'm updating a different file for the different applications due to the issues going on. And yes, like one of the key items that Mr. David had mentioned is after treatment. So that has been a big deal when it comes to dealing with, you know, what we're dealing with. So in this case, let's just get right into why are you here? You know, the, the, the bottom line why you're here is I hope that it is to gain more knowledge 
But let's face it, you know, it's not just an hour, an hour and a half of training that's going to make you a specialist. It requires more than that. So some of the phone calls I get can be very advanced. Some of the phone calls I get can be very annoying, if you don't mind me saying. And the reason why is because with today's day and age, if you have one of these, you know, and you have a cell phone, in this case, if you don't know stuff, it's because you don't want to know it. You have to take time to understand it. So, you know, there is a review we got to talk about in this case, uh, and that has been emission controls. There's a lot of scandal going on in every community that has any kind of diesel from the RV community to the trucks, to the light duty cars. You know, we're dealing with after treatment. That's been a big issue. And then we got the parts issues. There is some parts that are hard to get by because of the issue with getting, uh, you know, in other words, there's not enough parts going around. So we have to wait. Some things are a national back order. But then we need to know the old versus the new and take that old information, apply it to the new. But then we have to know electronics. You know, we're currently offering on our side an electrical class and it is the most needed training out there. And, you know, you want to talk about networks, you want to talk about electronics. And the pro bottom line is, if you don't have a good foundation with electrical, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. So, again, electrical is something that we need. But then we deal with the other subsystems of a diesel, which is the common rail, the turbochargers. And obviously, there is an engine. You know, the engine is very critical. We tend to forget that, hey, I still have an engine that needs to have adequate compression, no leaks, and so on as well. So, what is going on with today's diagnostics? What do I need to know? Do you know your diesel subsystems? You know, do you know your common rail very well? You know, there's piezo common rails. There is, you know, still solenoid style injection. There's many different manufacturers here in the U.S. We deal with primarily the more popular Bosch units. We got also the Denso common rail, and we got others that are still available to as well. But even though you, those systems have been out there for a while, there's still people that are weak in understanding how a common rail works. Some of you are still caught up on that CP4 high. And if you've been watching a lot of videos out there, especially like YouTube and so on, there's been discussion that the CP4 failure isn't as bad as people thought it was. So it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on there that, oh, it's happening and it's everything and not good. So apart from knowing your diesel to subsystems, do you have a diagnostic approach? We can sit here and talk technical here, but if you don't have any structure in your diagnostics, I'm sorry, this has been something I've been preaching for a while, but still, people do not follow. And for those of you that haven't heard this and other webinars that I've done and training that I've done is, you know, you got to have some basic steps of what you're going to follow first and what you're going to do. And then to top it off is are you literate in your service information system? You know, if you're dealing with all data, you're dealing with on demand, excuse me, you're dealing with um, Identifix and Pro Demand and your all data, and you're, you're still not very good at knowing where everything is, such as connector and views, diagnostic trouble codes, pinpoint tests, wiring schematics, diagrams. You got to get up to speed. And like I've been saying for a while now, is if you haven't had training from those specific service information providers, get that training from them. You can sit down with them for an hour and a half and know where stuff is at in your service information because that cuts time and gives you more access to repairing the truck a lot sooner. And then the big one, do you know after treatment? You know, do you, I mean, after treatment has been around since 2007, really. It's 2022, 2023. If you're still weak in after treatment, you know, shame on you. You should be up to date on after treatment. There's been many people teaching after treatment. You should be up to date on understanding diesel oxidation catalysts, diesel particulate filters, selective catalyst reduction. And now you got ammonia slip catalyst along with an ammonia sensor. And then do we understand the fuel quality and quantity codes that are now being set, such as with the Duramax L5Ps and the new Power Stroke 6.7? You know, it isn't just about replacing an injector and you still get these diagnostic trouble codes. But then with turbocharger issues, intake issues, you got common rail issues, engine issues, what effect does it do on the after treatment? You know, the classic one that I've always been saying is if a truck comes in with a blown head gasket, yeah, well, this is how much it is to do the head gasket. But then I don't know how that affected the after treatment. In other words, did coolant or oil or whatever go down into the after treatment and contaminate it and coat it? or poison it, as we like to say. And then what causes D-rate? A lot of the consumers are really irritated with the fact that a truck can go into D-rate, you know, 50 miles till, you know, it'll go into 50 mile per hour mode or it'll go to idle mode, or it's actually at idle mode. What do you do now? So people will push it sometimes. So we got to understand that. So let's move on. 
What is the most significant issue with diesel? It's been the emissions, like we said already, the after treatment. So we hope you know by now that, that after treatment targets just two things and two things only. And that is soot, which is particulate matter, and the oxides of nitrogen, which is NOx. That's it. I mean, gasoline is scrutinized with other ways, but in this case, that's all we're going after with diesel. And that's been our key problem. So when you're dealing with a diesel and you're trying to diagnose issues going on with the diesel, it can get costly. And as a shop, I understand it. I deal with my own customers it's like, okay, this truck has got 180,000 miles and it hasn't been well maintained. It's got excessive blow by. And then when it's under load pulling, the blow by is so bad, like a 6.4 I just dealt with, that is so bad that it actually went through four quarts on a trip that they did with over 200 miles. And in this case, all that oil was getting recirculated into the intake and it actually was just burning it. Next thing you know, it's puking and smoking. The diesel oxidation catalyst along with the filter is just loaded with burnt oil and issues going on there. So in this case, you know, you got to understand that <clears throat> what is the effects of the engine operation on the after treatment and then understanding the after treatment and its characteristics of how it works. In other words, you get on the truck, you get and test drive it, and it says drive a clean message right away. But then you take it in, you do a regeneration, and that actually cleans it up. But then again, you go two miles after performing a regeneration in the shop. And next thing you know, what happens is that the drive to clean message comes back, you know, so what's going on with that? Not to mention that we now have actually SER. So now we're dealing with SER issues. You know, SER is the death fluid stuff. For those of you not familiar, death, death fluid at blue. And in this case, we're injecting that death uh, fluid into the exhaust to readily convert into ammonia to break down the NOx. So as we're talking about an L5P, for example, here on the chart, you need to understand all the key components that are involved in any after treatment, regardless if it's a big diesel, small diesel, medium diesel, whatever it is, they all pretty much share the same characteristics. What I mean by that is you got a diesel oxidation catalyst, you got a NOx reducing catalyst, you got a diesel particulate filter, you know, you got a whole bunch of different components, and then add all the sensors right there. You got exhaust gas temperature sensors, you got NOx sensor one, NOx sensor two. Like, for example, if you pay attention to this one here, you actually will see that there's a number 15 there, and those number 15s are what? Those are NOx sensors. So in this case, we see number 15 there <clears throat> near number 16, if you look at the chart right there. And in this case, we are monitoring the oxides of nitrogen after the SER treatment that we inject the death fluid, which again, it's ammonia that breaks up the NOx. And then we have towards the latter half on an alpha IP, we got your diesel oxidation catalyst and your diesel particulate filter, which is number 13. Okay, so we have to understand how this is working. Obviously, this is not a, a after treatment class or a after treatment 101 class. But in this case, what we're trying to say is, is there a lot going on in today's exhaust? And this is 2017 technology you're looking at here. So when you look at 2017 and now we're rolling into 2022, into 23, you know, there's a lot more stuff going on here. Because if you notice closely, unlike a Ram Dodge, a Ram Dodge has a, an ammonia slip catalyst, which goes towards the tail end of the exhaust and also an ammonia sensor. So that's not shown here because this is a DRMX L5P. They are not using an ammonia slip catalyst. So in this case, that's also in the tail end of it. So what I want you to understand is, and this is something you have to understand. I'm sorry, but if you're working on these vehicles, it's something you understand, and that is this exhaust system that you see, there is thousands of dollars worth of sensors and components, but it is at the mercy of the quality of the exhaust that's coming down that exhaust. So in this case, if that engine has turbo issues, leaking oil, excessive blow by, we got common rail injector issues, overfueling, underfueling, sensor skewed, that's going to affect the after treatment. So it can, you have to get it through your head that one thing is after treatment, one thing is the engine operation, but you cannot address after treatment unless you have repaired and ensured that that engine is running properly. Very important to understand. But the problem is, you know, this past earlier in July, I actually went to, um, you know, I went to different, I actually took an East, you can say I took an East Coast trip and I visited some shops and did some classes. And in this case, it was amazing how many delete programs that we're dealing with. And in this case, when it comes to delete programs, is that, you know, they turn off stuff. For example, we had an L5P, and that L5P had definitely a rail pressure issue and a lip pump pressure issue, and there was zero code set. But this truck was completely deleted. 
So one thing you got to understand is that delete programs, as much as they're illegal, but I'm not here to tell you what to do, what not to do, go, whatever you do, you do. But the problem is, as a diagnostic technician, we are dealing with literally programs that are deleting, but yet they delete a lot of diagnostic codes. So that's a problem. So in this case, that does not work for us. So it, I always have said it'd be nice if you are going to use a delete program, make sure I can put it back to stock to see if that addresses issues that we have. So in this case, watch out for what's going on with the lead programs out there, because as diagnostic technicians, you know, we, we maybe you're not deleting. A lot of us do not delete anymore. We don't do any of that. But the problem is we're dealing with trucks that are deleted. And sometimes we need to put them back to stock because of the simple fact that the lead programs are causing havoc when it comes to a drivability, adaptive learning and diagnostic trouble codes that could be shut down that are necessary for us to diagnose what's going on. So hopefully you understand that as much as there's enforcement going on, you know, there's also issues for us, the technicians, that, you know, we have to have the ability to put it back to stock to see if there's any issues that may be related to the program itself that's illegal. So, so the bottom line is watch out for the lead programs and uh, please understand you could have issues. So with that said, I understand why they do deletes because there has been issues regarding the after treatment and codes are customers that I know that have bought brand new trucks and within 100 miles or 300 miles, a check engine lights on and they're already going to the dealership for warranty. That is a fact that is happening. So in this case, it kind of makes you wonder on the quality of the after treatment and the emission controls we're putting on today's trucks. But in this case, what can aid in the life, you know, of a diesel, you know, so you got this engine that's heavily constipated, heavily congested. And the first question to ask now is, you know, if I go buy a brand new Chevy Silverado truck, a, a Ram Cummins, Laramie, whatever package with everything on it, you know, what mileage should I expect to get from this diesel powered truck or car, you know? And it's in this case, is it 100,000 miles or 200,000 miles or 300,000 miles? What is it, you know? It isn't surprising that, you know, we are seeing six, seven power strokes on some light, du uh, medium duty trucks that are already needing engines at about 105,000. So in this case, we're seeing issues. So, you know, it all comes back to the maintenance, which I'll get to in a second. But there are faulty systems out there. Let's face it. There are issues going on. The programs, the things that we're seeing are not always consistent. So I don't want you to feel... And that's why networking with other technicians and, you know, using other means or avenues for you to help you out is very important because when I am trying to reset a D rate and every, there's no code set, but yet it won't get me out of D rate. We reflash a program. Then we reflash again, the program. I mean, there've been times I've had to reflash up to three times to get it to unlock D rate because I've driven it, but then I can't drive it on other situations where I'm at idle. There are some that are actually locked at 50, but some of them are locked at zero RPM, meaning I only got idle only. I can only go five miles an hour. So therefore, okay, we got to reflash it. And I understand there have been some shops that have actually put a whole new computer in it because of the fact that you couldn't get it unlocked out of D-rate. So yeah, it is a little faulty systems. I'll call it out. A lot of people don't want to say it. This is the reality what we see. So we do see higher horsepower and torque, but yet again, the emissions have to be met and there's all this emission stuff going on. And, you know, one technician said it best in my class. He says, you know, if you can't meet the emissions, and by the way, he's talking about the manufacturers, if you can't meet the emissions, don't make the power, you know, because you're tr it seems like these emission control systems are working barely to meet those emission requirements. You know, a good example I could tell you, and you could quote me on this because this is a reality. We had an F-350 2013 truck, okay? Uh, an F-350 2013 truck. And this truck was leaking death fluid that when we looked underneath the rear of the truck, where and if you know where the bottle is at for the death fluid, it's right next to the axle there on an F-350. The whole back of that truck, you know, in the rear left was actually just coated with death fluid crystallization. I mean, we literally had to start chipping away just to get to the tank because it was leaking so bad. The funny thing is, obviously, there was ne no death fluid being injected, but yet the truck was driven for over three months with no diagnostic trouble code set for NOx reduction. So go figure that. So you're like, wait a minute. There was no pressure being built up because it was literally just squirting. These guys said, well, we're going through death fluid like crazy. That was his complaint. Nobody ever bothered to look underneath. And there's, you know, oozes and oozes of crystallization on that rear of that truck. And yet there was no code set. So hold on a second. How could this truck be not in D-rate, 
no diagnostic trouble code set for any kind of deaf fluid pressure. Yet, when we finally got to the hose that comes out of the pump assembly, out of the top of the tank, you can see that the hose was disconnected and there literally was squirting the deaf fluid all over the back of that truck. So go figure, for three months they were driving it this way and it never said that. So you're, you're asking yourself, well, how is it that this truck did not go into D-Ray? So that's why I say now faulty systems. Now, those of you that don't understand is, you know, a good example is 134A. As you know, we have 1234YF used for air conditioning. During the 134 phase, I think it was back in 1996 timeframe when we switched over from R12 to 134A. People were saying, well, there's, you know, there's flammable gases being sold out there because it, 134 it wasn't the only gas. Now, 1234A has a little bit of flammable gas in it. So now it's okay to use. But always remember something. It's not about why the government approves something. It's, they just care, is it good for the environment or not good for the environment? And if it's good for the environment, that's all we care about, how well it works. That's another thing, you know, for engines and what's going on with that, so... But then the fact is, you know, there are trucks out there that we do not see that have a lot of miles. So in this case, you know, there's widespread thought of an after stream will shorten the life of an engine, this and that, but, but you know, and, but the biggest problem, I guess I'm trying to get to with this slide is, you know, some of you have seen this picture probably on Facebook. I thought it was, you know, a little frustrating for, because is there any training to tell consumers? So you, the technicians and you're the shops, you, the manufacturers, it's a good idea when you talk to your consumers, what is deaf fluid all about? So like the last bullet says right there, you know, there's no training or information to the consumer of the DOC, DPF, and especially the SER. So we see regulations for emissions. We often blame the components that are not on a diesel truck today. We see the use of deaf fluid, which many do not know what it is. So again, education is the key to tell the customers. But the most important thing that we have and this is probably the most important slide out of today's. I know you want to see more technical, and I'm getting to that. But in this case is the maintenance. Let's get it clear. From 15,000 miles to 10,000 mile old changes, I'm sorry, that's not cutting, especially if this truck does a lot of stop and go. That has to change because of the fact that the engine oil is taking the extreme punishment. Like I said earlier. This engine is heavily constipated. This engine is heavily congested. And in this case, when we're boosting with a variable vane turbo and we're creating a lot of back pressures, who's taking the bulk of the punishment? The engine oil. So in this case, engine oil changes need to change at least to 5,000 miles, if not better. So driving habits and vehicle load will influence them dramatically how this engine oil will get overloaded because as you know, engine oil does not wear out. It gets overloaded. So, you know, just understand got to change the oil, change intervals, because again, the dilution is to break down the engine oil, especially when you're running active regenerations where you're actually running post-injections, like on a power stroke 6.7. So remember, yes, we do talk about regeneration. It is the process of burning soot. So burning soot creates ash. Can you get premature ash loading? You know, it kind of begs the question, what is the consumer putting into this engine oil? You know, what are they putting into the fuel? Are they running two-stroke oil? Are they running transmission fluid and so on? You know, we got to understand that that all affect the suit accumulation. So as we look at a Ram Cummins after treatment right here, you still got the same key components, just like you saw on that L5P, except the arrangement's a little bit different. But regardless, though, you know, Cummins makes it a little harder because you cannot do a regeneration at will, meaning that if I get into a Ford, I get into a Chevy Duramax, GMC Duramax, I can go ahead and run a regeneration whether it needs it or not. But a Grams Cummins requires a code 1451. Don't quote me on a 22 model. I haven't played with a 22 model, but I know from 21 and back, you definitely need a code 1451 in order to run a regeneration. So the thing that I've always said about regeneration, by the way, has been when you do a oil change or you're doing, you know, your uh, any type of maintenance on the truck, wouldn't it be a good idea to run a regeneration on those trucks that allow you to do it, such as the Duramax and the Power Strokes? Wouldn't it be a good idea to run a regeneration to clean off any suit that is in there and then do the oil change? Therefore, when the consumer leaves that garage, you know, they actually have no issues with, uh, you know, having to run regenerations provided that the engine is running at optimum performance. So silly things as air filters will affect a lot. So that's important to understand. 
Now, the more intense training requires you to understand, and that's why we talk about networks. I mean, just look at this slide right here. You're going to notice the PCM on the upper left. You got high speed CAN communication going to the NOC sensor module. You got your glow plug control module. And then you got all the components that are all communicated their data over to the PCM. But it all takes place with high speed communication. So as we look at the newer trucks, such, such as the new LM2 Duramax, you know, the LM2 is now being replaced already, by the way. It's, it's been around for a little bit already. It's being replaced. But what I'm trying to say is there is a lot of high speed CAN communication where we have seen issues with high speed CAN communication dropping down due to a key component that's in the network shutting down that side of the network. Imagine you're trying to scan a vehicle and you've got no communication. And in this case, what key component could be shutting down that communication there? So even as simple as the glow plug control module and its appropriate components, such as your level sensor, temperature sensors, and heaters are all there. But don't get too technical either. As you can see from this slide, you can see the reductant injector or the death fluid injectors here. Here you can see on the left, you can see the heavily suit accumulation clog, and then you can see the brand new one on the right. And in this case, you can see clearly the difference where one was clogged or another. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if supposedly if there is not adequate death fluid injection, you actually should have a high NOx outlet content. So therefore, this is what we found on this truck that we were working on where we did not have no flow. So those tests that you're supposed to do with SER are one of them is a volume and spray test. And sure enough, we had hardly any death fluid being injected due to the suit accumulation on the end of this reductant injector. Now, as we look at today's trucks, yes, we are dealing with a lot here. And, you know, when I look, and hopefully yours is moving a little slowly, I understand it's a video, but these are the realities of what we deal with. In this case, you know, the truck will come in with five miles per hour, you know, max. In other words, I'm pretty much only idle. We are dealing with 233,000 miles on a truck, you know. So in this case, you have to have some sort of approach. That approach when it comes to the SER means that you're going to have to go ahead and scan for codes. What specifically is coming back that's actually causing you issues? You know, in this case, on this truck, our problem was we had a bad death pump. But in this case, we consistently had death pump circuit issues and code set. So in this case, that led us to do the testing, the appropriate diagnostic chart. And again, one thing was to get the pump going, get the pump primed up. But then we had to get it out of D-Ray. So what do we do afterwards? You know, what is the next key thing we're supposed to do? So where to start, right? What do we do with uh, diesel diagnostics and where to start? Because when I do a scan on a truck, right? And when I'm scanning a truck here, you're going to notice here that, you know, that we can have a array of codes. For example, this is a 2017 L5P. And we have our, uh, as a matter of fact, let me go back a second. You're going to see there we got our injection timing code, cylinder number three. Now, we have seen issues with the L5P, just like the old, um, what is that, the LLYs, where we had the pigtail connectors on certain cylinders, which I believe was number five, I forget, on L5P. But we have have had some injector issues. We've had some fuel rail pressure issues. But then we can have injection three timing. What do I mean by timing? Well, the thing is, you got to understand that today's diesel truck, especially the L5P and the new Power stroke 6.7s are now closed loop operation. In other words, did I underfuel or did I overfuel? Now, in the past, you had a situation where you can look at the behavior of an injector just by looking at the fuel trim, or you can look at balancing rates. That was the command to add fuel or to subtract fuel. So, therefore, he's monitoring that, but also looking at the knock sensor one, knock sensor one, to know what's going on. Because if you haven't yet learned, Knock sensors, please note that knock sensors are an oxygen sensor. So therefore, you're going to have to be more prevalent of why is that cylinder behaving this way? Why does it need to be advanced or retarded the timing or the quantity of it injector having to change? Could it be the injector itself? Yes. As you know, the number one enemy of common rail has always been dirt. So that could be the problem too. But it could be something else too. So, you know, you're dealing with all of this. And then when you deal with trucks like I get, I got a YouTube video on this one, 
And this one, you know, you just look at it and everything and everything is going on. The dead fluid gauge wasn't working. You know, fluid fuel gauge wasn't working. These are the realities of what I get. You know, in this case, I mean, you got every message in the world on and you're like, you know, where do I go after first? Well, in this case, obviously, I, I decided to go after the SER system here. And, uh, you know, the SER was a big problem. We had a power problem going to the SER. So we had to address that issue. But again, you're you're scratching your head going, where do I start? Well, the SER is very important. I got to get that to that. get to that first. I already decided to do that for the simple fact that the engine also was running fine. Engine had no issues. And once I start the engine, you're going to notice, very, look very closely at the RPM gauge, and you're going to see that I have RPM, but I have no check engine light. Yet, look at the def fluid gauge and the fuel gauge. You know, so this is one of the cases where I prove my case that some of these systems can be flawed. You know, so things things you understand. So with diagnostic trouble codes, the question begs: Do you understand still? Come on, you should know by now what a diagnostic trouble code is. It's a test. So therefore, if you're clearing codes, that's fine. But let's see what comes back because I'm lazy sometimes when I approach a diagnostic, and in this case, that diagnostic requires me to go what. I want to go ahead and see what code might come back because it should be actively monitoring for any issues. So record it, you know, like for example, if I use my snap on Varus, it keeps a log of the codes that were on the truck, no matter what I do. So if I clear them, I see what actively comes back and I'm able to see what's going on. But if you're one of those people that want to continue to run the test and run the test and run the test, such, a, such as a reductive fluid quality test, such as running regenerations and so on, if you have diagnostic trouble codes, that's leading you to somewhere and you need to understand how the system works to know how that code applies. So yeah, where are we now? You know, it takes time and money. This slide is certain simple in reality because it takes time and money, you know, because we have to research, we got to understand what's going on. So when a customer brings in these trucks, they should be understanding that, hey, this is the diagnostic feed. This is the information I need to look up. These are the codes I got to research. This is my diagnostic time. A lot of you are good about saying, hey, one hour, and then after an hour, we're going to tell them we're going to need more diagnostic time or not. But it cannot work again. Repeating. You, if you don't have a diagnostic strategy, this cannot work if you're just shooting from the hip. For example, the truck comes in, right? It's in D-rate, and you got a lot of suit accumulation code set on the truck, right? And in this case, you're focusing on, okay, I got excessive suit accumulation. I'm going to run a regeneration. You try to run a regeneration, but then it kicks it out for some odd reason. There's a inhibit mode that it'll kick you out and it'll give you the reason. But then you got to ask yourself, why did I have so much suit accumulation? For example, we had a truck with the exact same issue, suit accumulation, running regenerations. And these guys did not have a diagnostic strategy of checking something as frivolous as the air filter. OK, turns out the air filter was clogged, so it was running a fuel rich exhaust because it wasn't getting enough oxygen because the air filter was so clogged. So in the meantime, they had spent so much time trying to run regenerations and getting kicked out. And turns out it was what? Something as stupid as yes, it is stupid. I'm sorry, as an air filter that was actually restricted. So, again, what are you always going to perform? So my challenge that I've been teaching in my classes like my diesel master course and my hands-on classes and even my seminars has been, will you please sit down, get a piece of paper, say, and make a commitment to yourself. Number one, what am I always going to do? Number two, what am I always going to do? What three, what are you always going to do? Because when I go to places, I get put on the spot. Hey, Tony, you got to fix to help us fix these trucks. And, you know, they're looking at me. You teach it, you work on it. Yeah. Okay. But I follow a diagnostic strategy. And any time that I've lured myself away from that diagnostic strategy, boy, it gets me in trouble. So again, given the quantity and oops, given the quantity of quality of technician needed knowledge and diagnostic scan tool, you know, there is an appropriate cost for a diagnostic. And it, to me, it should be above 150 minimum. So if you're dealing, if you're doing $90, $100, maybe it's a rural area you might be in, but diagnostics now cost money. You know, I just re up my tech, uh, global tech two, and I just did my uh, IDS and that was over $2,200, you know, so therefore that adds more cost, not to mention the updates for my other scan tools and other tools that I need consistently. So, but as we diagnose, do you still understand what the lights are for? So if you're taking notes, hopefully you are, those of you that haven't seen me talk about this, there are two lights you got to understand. Number one is the check engine light malfunction indicator lamp. Number two is the SER light on any application. The SER light is telling you one of two things, and get this through your heads. Number one is that light, SER light, is for, as a matter of fact, 
Let's see if we can get my uh, PowerPoint act up here. So let me make this clear. Oops, let me go back. Darn it. <laughs> Hit the wrong button. Sorry, guys. Go back, go back. Yes, thank you. It just gets worse here. Let's go. All right, we're back here. What I'm trying to show here is when you look right here, okay, that light right there that my cursor is circling, okay, that light is a Knox light. You can you can think of it as a Knox light. It's telling you one of two things. A, I'm not able to reduce Knox. B, I haven't been able to confirm that I have Knox reduction. That's the way it's supposed to work, okay? So in this case, what I'm trying to say is it's telling you A, I haven't been able to reduce Knox, or B, I haven't been able to confirm that I'm reducing Knox, okay? So with that said, if you have a check engine light, most likely 99.9% .9 sure you got a diagnostic trouble code set. He found the test that has failed. But if it's accompanied by the SCR light, I'm willing to bet that it has something to do with the SCR deaf fluid system, okay? But is it possible that I can have the SCR light on, but no check engine light? The answer is yes. That means you got to let it test for any NOx reduction. So it all comes back to after treatment once again and understanding what it is. So let's get this slide for a second. So you got to understand as you approach the after treatment system, and yes, I am repeating myself a little bit in the hopes you remember, is have you ever think about the effects of poor diesel engine operation on the after treatment system? So always remember that. Don't go after the SCR system if you got an engine running like not very wood, you know, it's running like crap. But if you remember, know how it works. So like we said already, that deaf fluid's injected. When that deaf fluid's injected, it readily converts to what? Ammonia. It is the ammonia that breaks up the NOx. And then afterwards, we got a NOx reducing catalyst. So remember, there's a DOC, diesel oxidation catalyst, there's a diesel particular filter, and then there's a NOx reducing catalyst, better known as the NOx brick. So a good example that I've been saying over, take a look at this picture of this Ford product right here. And you could see here that the speed it will be limited in 50 miles to 44 miles to, excuse me, speed will be limited to 50 miles per hour in 44 miles. So it's giving you a warning and there's that light on, there's that SCR light, you can see it there. And in this case it's saying, hey, I am going to limit you to 50 miles per hour in 44 miles. So you got 44, mile, 44 miles to address this issue. Now pay attention to the RPM here. It is idling right now. Look at the RPM. And in this case, you're like, well, what's going on here? There's no check engine light on. So there's no codes that have failed, no test that has been failed. But he's telling you, I haven't been able to confirm that there is adequate NOx reduction. So there's not a failure yet, but I haven't been able to confirm. So what I did as I will skim through this video is we went ahead. Let me mute my voice there. But in this case, what I'm trying to show you here is you know, we ran a regeneration. So I decided to run a regeneration because in order for that ammonia to break out the NOx, I need to make sure that there's heat. Heat is the name of the game in the after tree. But before I did that, just to make sure I had no powertrain, no P codes. I had other codes and other subsystems, but I didn't have no P codes. So there was no code set. So all I did, now remember, this truck's getting ready in 44 miles to derate you because he says he has a NOx problem but it hasn't been able to verify that. So all I did was, you know, and I'm gonna skim through this, is I ran a regeneration here. So now upon running a regeneration, here you can see the temperatures as I'm running regeneration. You know, I'm, I'm down to 6%, so I burned a lot of that suit, right? So we ran the regeneration for about 40 minutes here, okay? But then what's funny upon running the regeneration and poor truck, this truck took a big punishment because if you look at the video, it was a 111 degree day, you know, so this thing was really running hot. Anyways, once we got done with the regeneration, as you could see that we're finishing up, what had happened was, is that the message went away, as you can see there. So therefore the message went away. So all it needed was a little heat to actually run a NOx reduction test to ensure that there is a proper NOx reduction. So therefore, the D-rate warning and the light went away. That's why it's important for you to understand what that light is for. And that light, the SCR light, is to tell you, A, inadequate NOx reduction, or B, I haven't been over to verify there is adequate NOx reduction. So, so therefore, the engine is working, and that engine oil, like I'm repeating myself with maintenance, is, you know, like we said already, the engine's working hard, higher boost levels. I mean, it isn't surprising that today's LM2 Duramax is reaching over 36 PSI, if not greater, a boost. 
you're dropping the compression ratios, but they're raking up the, the boost level. So therefore we're seeing a lot more boost. So what is the effects on that on engine oil? So it kind of goes back to the effects of what you need to know of the engine oil on, you know, on the engine itself. So with that said, got to know it. So let's move on. Now we're talking about the Cummins applications. If you've been playing with Cummins 6.7s on these Ram trucks, uh, please note, just a friendly reminder, everything driven by Cummins has been by serial number. If you don't know where the serial number has always been on the valve cover. Earlier models had a metal tag in front of the front cover on the side of the cover somewhere, but you had a, or you do have a serial number. Here you could see a better look at this from the actual Cummins Ram Cummins manual. So some of these numbers are needed, especially when we're doing reprogramming or we're ordering parts sometimes from a Cummins dealer. Just a quick note, uh, QuickServe has been around for a while with Cummins, but please note you do have an app now available. So you can download that app when you're working with Cummins, when you want information. And all you need to do is enter the serial number. And in this case, that serial number will give you all the information, that basic information you may need, but also get you into Cummins itself, especially if you're ordering certain parts that are not available from other vendors, especially when you're dealing with a Cummins application. So word to the wise, you can get that quick service mobile. It's been helpful for me. I've used it quite a few times on my phone here. So therefore I just pull the serial number then and I'm able to get part numbers and cross part numbers too. That also works very well. So now with the Cummins 6.7, a lot has been going on ever since 2007 and its birth to now in 2022, 2023. The common rail, I got to tell you, I can't remember how many part numbers or fuel filters there are, so many fuel filter changes they made through the years. The good thing is they went to a two filter system. There is still a filter on the backside next to the spare or pretty close to the spare tire. So remember, we have more than one nowadays, but because what played a common rail from 03 on a 5.9 till the later model 5.9 has been the fact that we didn't have adequate filtration. We had number five and six injectors failing for the simple fact of contamination. So therefore remember cleanliness is the most important thing in common rail. Uh, we have been doing a lot of um, diagnosis with these and it's still to the day, guys cannot, uh, even when we do our diesel master course, when guys have to show me that they can put a transfer tube with the injector in there. And what happens is that a lot of the times they don't seal it correctly and they got a leak going to the return. So we could have a higher return than normal because of that. So please keep in mind that it's important that you, A, replace those transfer tubes when you replace injectors and make sure you line them up correctly and torque them appropriately the way the service manual does, does require you to. We've been saying this for a while. Some guys have been asking me questions about this. Um, you should by, know by now that the sim, 6, 7 Cummins, the injection CP3 pump does have a locating, shall we say, number and a zero that you're going to actually put this in correct phasing. So you're phasing or timing it in correctly. So make sure you do that. Obviously, I'm not going to go through it, but just note there is instructions in your service information telling you how to properly install that CP3 injection pump. So like we've been saying with Common Rail, and you should know this by Common Rail, and that is, you know, always remember, what is the enemy of Common Rail? Contamination, cleanliness. So how clean is the fuel system? Uh, it's always a good idea to check lift pump volume, average of one liter in 30 seconds. So are you aware there's another fuel filter on the rear of the truck? Because guess what? We've had quite a few trucks, even with the CP4 pump, that actually had the customer had no knowledge there was a filter underneath there, never been replaced in 30,000 miles or 40,000 miles. And that was one of their main problems. So it's very important to understand. So as I mentioned at the beginning, it's important to understand that on these Cummins applications, along with the power strokes and Duramaxes, those Cummins that use two years, only two years, they use the Cummins 6.7. So those of you that don't know, they went back to a CP3. It's a different CP3 supposedly, but we haven't gotten no more information on that. But what is the weakness of a CP4? Low lift pump pressure and air. That CP4, guys, has been used on other applications and you guys ought to know by now that you know, the lift pumps and all that have a lot to do with it, but also how you do the maintenance. For example, when you change the fuel filter on a 6.7 power stroke, for example, well, you're going to go ahead and prime the system, you change the filters, and then at that point, you're going to go ahead and put it all back together, fire it up. Well, what we're asking you to let it work out the air, you should actually do as an early Ford bulletin used to say is, you should actually let the truck idle between 10 to 15 minutes after a fill 
fuel filter replacement for the simple fact that you wanted to work out any air that might be in there. So that would be the good thing. So same thing applies to six, six, seven. Anytime we do fuel filters, guess what we're doing? We're also letting the truck idle for about at least 10 to 15 minutes while we go wash our hands, have a soda, have a coffee, and then we'll get to it there. So yes, there is a modified version of the CP3. We don't know all the details. It is not the same CP3. They're saying it's a CP3 on stairs. If you got more info on it, I'm all ears, but uh, we don't know enough yet going on with that. So, But Cummins 6.7 is still using the old fashioned ball and seat solenoid style injector. Modifications have been done. So in case you did not know, Cummins 6.7 never went to piezo. You know, they stayed with solenoid style injection, so therefore that still exists. For those of you that understood the 6.7 Cummins, please be aware, especially if you're working with the older models, that solenoid is a coil, and that coil can get shorted. And in this case, it's imperative that if you do have a shorter coil, there's a 50-50 chance it could hurt the computer. So therefore, be aware of that too. Moving on. Hopefully, we haven't exhausted you. Duramax LM2, a quick review of the LM2. I'm going, to, I'm going to skip through a few of these. If you haven't been yet trained, you haven't seen any presentations on the three liter, it's uh, it's getting good reviews. It's had its headaches, but nothing to say that it's catastrophic. So in this case, uh, it is uh, paired with a 10-speed transmission. Yes, there is a 10-speed transmission on these trucks, on the 1500 trucks that are equipped with this. And the truck itself has a lot of differences that you're probably not used to used to but engine compartment is pretty friendly as you see on this one that i took a picture of um you know first of all the battery has a cover on the box you pretty much the cover stands tall over the battery cover fuse box fuse locations are all about the same the block is lightweight aluminum solar head aluminum so you can see it's an all aluminum engine for those of you that don't know along with a forged steel crankshaft and connecting rods so yeah it's pretty stout uh, like I said, look at the compression ratio in the middle, 15 to 1. That's why it's running with a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of boost there. So, and also the, you're going to see that the common rail injection system used in it is a Denzel like the L5P. And it also runs with some serious rail pressure as well. So in this case, we see our turbo actuator, all external, pretty easy to get to. The exhaust exits to the front of the vehicle, and then it makes a U-turn to the back, but it still has its knock sensors. But the LM2 has not one, not two, but three knock sensors itself. The charge air cooler is liquid cool sitting on the top. So in this case, again, more of a reason for you to make sure you know your cooling system, because this cooling system is a little bit different. And in this case, we have to understand how it works very well, because again, that is cooling the incoming air coming into the engine. So therefore, it's very important. It does have dual cams, rear chain drive. What? Yep, rear chain drive system. So therefore, it's one of the first systems we noticed that the three-liter was how, how the exhaust from the turbo immediately feeds outward towards the front, and then it immediately goes into the after treatment. But I'll get to that here in a second. But the most... The biggest thing you're going to see that pretty much sets the stage of what we're going to see in the future now is SCRF, meaning that we're seeing the SCR on filter. The SCR NOx catalyst is now integrated with the diesel particulate filter. So that's why we call it the SCRF, SCR filter. So in this case, the SCR catalyst and the actual diesel particulate filter are all one unit there. And that's what you see there. Okay. There's your chain drive. The biggest thing people have been talking about, you probably know about by now, if you've been watching the LM2 information, has been that 150,000 mile belt drive that drives the oil pump. That's the one you see on the lower portion of there. So yeah, 150,000, they're saying you need to go ahead and replace the belt. Yeah, transmission has to come out. There's a cover there. So, But here, what we're trying to show here is how that exhaust, like I said, comes out and goes towards the back. So you got your SCROF. You got your def fluid injector right there. Then you got another set of catalysts and another diesel oxidation catalyst. But what's nice is that that EGR gas is filtered by the particulate filter before that EGR gas goes towards the EGR valve itself. Pretty cool. So like I said already about the Denzel common rail, that's pretty much Denzel going on with all the Duramax applications. The max pressures we're reaching now is 36,250 PSI. It is still solenoid, not piezo. It is not piezo. It is solenoid style injection here on these Denzel applications. So hopefully I didn't do that, say that. 
but also be aware that there are 10 injections per cylinder event that you're going to see here. So quite a lot going on right there. So the specifications, well, you know, you can look that up in technical specification, but you are capable, I said 36,000 PSI of rail pressure, but you're also going to see 42.8 PSI of boost, of bar max boost, and that's what you're going to see there. So be aware of that high boost there that's going on with these engines, generating that 277 horsepower, 460 foot-pounds of torque. Now, like I said, when you scan these, you're going to see changes. And probably the biggest change you're going to see here with the new applications of Duramax, not just the L5P, is actually um, you're going to see that there are code sets. So I'm going to play this for a second. And you're going to see all the codes coming out of here and all the different family of codes from different subsystems. Okay, so we're seeing all the codes there. And uh, you're going to see there that, uh, and I'm scrolling down here, sorry, it's taking a while. But in this case, you're going to see an array of different codes. And in this case, you're going to see the amplifier assist step control. Just keep going on here. And, and uh, there's your body control module. So you're dealing with this a slew of different modules that you're going to see diagnostic trouble codes. And everyone's important because you can have shared codes among them. But in this case, what you're going to see here is a, probably a new one that you're going to have to learn is that one right there that I see, the serial gateway module. As you will look at your diagnostic or your uh, pretty much your diagnostic link connector where you plug in your OBD2 connector, you're going to see that all communication tends to go to a gateway module. So there's processor one, processor two. So in our classes, we're going to be elaborating more on these when it comes to understanding how communication is taking place there. So, so obviously, you're going, to, you're going to learn more. You're going to look at all your data menus available. In this case, the data menus are becoming more extensive. So again, you got to get acclimated with all the different subsystems that you got to deal with. And this is just engine data and information related to the after treatment, you know, so you got a lot going on here that you're going to have to diagnose there. But again, knowledge is power. And the reason why I tell you that is because, for example, the both the LM2 and the L5P have three phase, three phase lip pumps. So in this case, it has three phase lip pumps and I could look at the circuit status, for example, way on the top here, I can see that the fuse Fuel pump phase UVW circuits, shortest status, okay. He's telling me the status of those circuits. So he's constantly testing those circuits of those three phases. So in the scan data, I am able to see that information along with my short to voltage, you know, high voltage concerns, shorted statuses. I can see if it's okay or not okay. So stuff you can see there. Look at your right though. You also got fuel pump speed command. You got your fuel pump speed, your actual speed. And this is just for the fuel pump, the lift pump itself. So therefore, you got a lot of data available to you. So obviously, this is not a dedicated class, but we got a lot going on here that you can view. Good stuff, good information there. Now, don't worry, it's still traditional diesel. You still got glow plugs and glow plug connectors. And there you could see the standard, you know, what you are used to in injectors themselves and the wiring harness is going to the injectors. But like we said already, these new Duramaxes are... Again, getting some serious, uh, you know, a lot of different pressures going on there. Not to mention you got the engine oil. You're going to see now that what's recommended is 0W20 on these engines. So therefore, be aware of the engine that's recommended. Not to mention, understand what's going on with the cooling system. We're teasing you with this to get you to want more training on this because in this case, there's an active thermal management system. I mean, think about it. Do we really need coolant circulation when the engine warms up? We want the engine to warm up as fast as possible. So there is again, a engine control, flow control valve that is part of the ATM or active thermal management system. So therefore it controls again, the flow of coolant. Only a different ball of wax on this guy. There you can see the after treatment right there. Like I said already, you can see the different catalysts going down into the exhaust. But number eight is a little interesting because number eight is actually a kind of a plate, not a throttle plate, but it's actually an exhaust plate that can open and close actually to create more back pressure, less back pressure for faster warmups. So there you could see that. 
So again, you got to know your after treatment systems going on with these systems and know what's going on. So I can't say enough of that. Again, moving over to the L5P only. The L5P has 444 horsepower, 910 foot-pounds of torque, you know, as of 2020 model year. The tow ratings are incredible. Remember, as much as they can tow a lot, remember, there's also a braking system. There's a transmission system, a suspension that's at the mercy of these heavy weights. So that's why we see the medium duty. These L5D Duramax is an international badged cab trucks that are international cabs. Uh, please note they're using the Duramax L5D, which is similar to the L5P. And in this case, just note that these trucks are a little derated, less horsepower, but you know they're out there in numbers, especially here in Vegas. We see a whole bunch of them. So, and the problem is a lot of guys aren't getting proper training, understanding how these Duramaxes work. You know, very important to understand. So, it is a uh, ten quart system, which I kind of question. It does reach twenty nine psi, a Denzel common rail. There's thirty two valves, seven injection events. Yes, we do see that. Uh, but just understand that this engine is a. Uh, it's been a very good engine, but the problem is, again, maintenance is the key. 10,000 mile oil change, interval, oil change intervals does not cut it in reality. Now, one key thing you got to understand here is something as frivolous as your generator alternator. Look at the bottom line right there. It says the voltage regulator controls the amount of current provided to the rotor. If the generator has field control circuit failure, something's going on in the field current inside of that generator. In other words, that rotor assembly. The generator defaults to an output voltage of 13.8. So that means it'll only put out 13.8, a fixed 13.8, something you've never seen before, because usually when all air don't work, it don't charge. The voltage goes down under 12.6. This one locks in at 13.8. But what you need to understand now is the body control module's in play now. So the body control module's in play because he's the one that's telling the PCM when energize again, the actual voltage regular that we see internal in the alternator. So therefore he determines the output of the generator and sends information to the ECM for control of the generator to turn on the signal circuit. So now when I'm diagnosing charging system problems, I'm gonna go, to, to go into body control, ECM, and then into the alternator itself to diagnose what's the problem. And obviously if there's a problem, it could actually default to 13.8 volts but it monitors the actual current. If you've been working with Ram Dodgers, they've been using this already, where they actually put an amp clamp. Look at it as an amp clamp, because that's what it is. It's, it's monitoring the current, and current is amperage. So in this case, it's monitoring the current and the actual draw and charging of it. So it's making a lot of your charging system testing very scan tool favorable for you to actually diagnose that. So pretty cool. So in this case, we're looking at that. The Denzel Commoner, what can I tell you? Well, first of all, a lot of changes for those of you that because they're making the biggest significant change, I'll show you Power Stroke 6, 7 here in a bit. And in this case, what we're trying to show you here is um, you perform scan tool function. You can enable the fuel pump with the scan tool. You can monitor the lift pump scan tool pressure of 54 to 65 PSI. So in this case, yes, we do have a lift pump in the tank. And right next to the tank on the rear of that truck, you're going to see the actual fuel filter. But then on the fuel filter is a fuel pressure sensor. You can disconnect that lift pump pressure sensor and let it go into default and see if it, that's your problem, why you have a drivability problem. But you can now monitor fuel lift pump pressure. So with that, you still got IQA codes on the Denzel common rail. So you still have to program the injectors correctly into the ECM itself and make sure those are correct per appropriate cylinders. Uh, Duramax still does the one, three, five, and seven on one side, two, four, six, and eight on the other side. But your job is to understand the whole system, how it works, because we have already been, in, you know, been pulling our hair with some issues with L5Ps, so, and the L5Ds as well. So there've been issues with, for example, with the fuel pressure sensor, number seven. Number seven is a dual fuel pressure sensor, and it's two sensors in one. And that had had connection problems and connector problems. So that was giving us some intermittent loss of power codes. Like I said already, we've had pigtail connection problems with some of these injectors on the L5P. And then we have had some lift pump pressure issues as well. And look at number six. You're going to see that number six is actually your indirect injector they've been using on Duramaxes for a while there. Again, better look at that right there. 
So obviously the pump turns on when you turn the key on, the pump turns on. And just a quick look, you know, obviously this is not a full blown L5P class. Just understand that when we talk about the lift pump, this is what we mean by three phase. We got three wires feeding the motor that are pulse width modulating to control the speed and it's monitoring the speed and there's your ground right there. And this is all part of a fuel pump driver control module, which is K111 there. So again, understand that K111, how it works and the wiring checks that you have to do. So again, you got to understand how it works because you can get codes. Now, like a, any truck out there, okay? Like any truck out there. And let me take a break here for a second. On any truck out there, you know, we're monitoring now the performance of each cylinder. That's all been done with angular velocity of the crankshaft. So as that crankshaft rotates, the computer sees the rate of speed of that crankshaft. And it all does it by, you know, thousands, microseconds, you know, it, it can determine that using the crank sensor along with the cam sensor. So the ECM will look at every angular velocity of the crank every time a cylinder fires and determines power contribution. So this colored pie chart, I know it's a little cheesy, but it kind of tells you how one cylinder can contribute more to the other. That could be attributed to compression. It could be attributed to the injector performance because it underfueled, it or overfueled. The job of the computer is to compensate for that, but know if it compensated too much or too little causing emissions. Because let's face it, if you overfuel, you underfuel too much or too little, you can cause high knocks, but then and you can actually cause, again, loss of fuel economy, but then again, it affects your emissions. Look at it that way. So we need to monitor that. That's where you got codes like the PL26C to PL26D, which is fuel injection quantity is either too high or too low. In other words, you can have too much fuel injection going on. So that's now a code that you're going to be dealing with. So it could be something as injectors need cleaning or they need to be replaced, but it could also be what is the, the compression of that engine. I mean, let's face it. I get a truck that comes in. It's got 180,000 miles on it. I will sell the customer a compression test because me diagnosing this truck is like me walking into a dark cave. I don't know where I'm going to find because that can also lead to knock sensor one issues. So in this case, for example, the classic one I could tell you on a Duramax LML was we had a Knox Performance 1 code. The truck ran great. The only code we had, and again, I looked at everything on the truck. Yes, I followed the diagnostic strategy. And in this case, I kept getting Knox Sensor 1 performance. Well, I, I did also notice that there was an update flash program for this truck. So I updated the flash because that's one thing you got to understand when you're dealing with Knox sensors. Make sure that the truck, whether a Ford or Ram or a Duramax, you got to make sure they have the latest update flash programming. So did all that, and guess what? Cleared the code, not even five minutes outside of the shop door as we're getting ready to turn and go on a test drive. Boom, Knox Sensor 1 performance sets. I could not figure out what was going on. I couldn't see anything because let's face it, with a Knox Sensor, what do I got? There you look at the picture. There's a module, there's CAN communication, there's power under the ground, there's it. There's no sensor signal I can monitor. So I'm like, I'm looking at the parts per million NOx because we got no information regarding parts per million, what is too much or too little, which now I do understand. But I'm like, what's causing this? Finally, I waved the white flag. You know what? We're going to put a NOx sensor in it because I can't find anything wrong. I don't know why I'm only getting a NOx sensor one. Everything else is working great. No other codes failed. Put a NOx sensor in it. And I really knew this, the subconscious of me was saying, it's not going to fix it. Put it on. Right, put it on, fired up the truck, clear the codes. Again, no more than five minutes outside the door of the shop. Boom, knock sense of performance. So for the next two, three days, I'm going crazy trying to figure out what am I doing wrong? What's causing high knocks? So we have to know what caused high knocks. Knocks is caused by your reaching combustion temperatures that are very hot. Finally, after the second night of no sleep or three nights of sleep, I forget how many nights of sleep, I'm like, you know what? If we're overfueling, that's going to make the combustion chamber hotter. So that's going to create more knocks. And immediately I got back into the shop the next morning. And the first thing I did is connect my scan tool and I reset the fuel adaptive learns, fuel adaptive learns. So I reset it on the scan tool because you could reset that on a GM Duramax L5P. I mean, LML and L5P. And... Immediately cleared the code, took it for a test drive, code never came back. In other words, the computer had learned 
to overfuel and it stayed that way for some odd reason. So that's why they give us the ability on a scan tool to reset it. And guess what? Knock sensor one performance. So did I replace the knock sensor for no reason? Yes, I did. I shamefully say that, yes, I did replace that. So you got to understand that it's a closed loop system, you know? In other words, the knock sensors are a feedback as oxygen sensors to tell the computer if you're overfueling, underfueling. And if it's overfueling, you might get injector quantity codes or also you might get injector timing codes as well. But you better understand what causes knocks, and that is excess combustion temperatures that get very hot. All righty. So as I'm going towards the latter key here, hopefully we kept you awake. We got a few. About another 15 minutes left before we go into a Q&A. What about 6.7? You know, the power stroke 6.7. That is, I see more 6.7s more than any other truck. Let's face it, there's more power stroke 6.7s out there. And in this case, you know, you got to understand that it's a Ford engine. It's not Navistar, reverse flow heads. You should know a 6.7. So if you haven't taken a 6.7 class on, you know, the reverse flow and everything that's going on with them. There's a lot that's happened now since 2011, over 11 years now of 6.7s. We've seen the CP4 issues. And yes, there are power stroke 6.7s that I know of that got over 200,000 miles and still running with the same CP4 pump. But then we're getting new stuff. Let me give you an example. On the common rail on the 6.7, I get a phone call on an F650 750. And I went to go see the truck. It's locally here. And literally, as you're cranking over, the technician took all the injector lines off, and he's cranking it, and he was saying that he was getting too much pr air pressure in the injector lines. I said, how did you, what led you to that? He says, well, first of all, I'm not creating real pressure, and the thing is, I had some pressure, but I decided to crack the lines just to see what's going on, see if I got air trapped in there. I go, well, it's supposed to bleed the air off. Crack a line open. As you're cranking and you hear your major pressure, what the hell's going on? Took all the injector lines off, cranked it, and you could see two injectors literally spitting out, which was number six and number five, I believe, on opposing sides, you know, and they were literally pushing up compression. So we had an internal melt. Something broke inside that injector that was leaking out the compression. So you get these weirdy ones that you've never heard of. So as these trucks are aging, we're seeing more of them starting to see more interesting common rail issues that we've never seen before. But um, the 6.7 went through an update in 2015. Now with 2020, we see an update too as well. So therefore, a lot of changes going on. So yeah, it's a monster at 475 horsepower, 1,050 foot-pounds of torque. But again, when you're dealing with issues with the 6.7, we've seen, like the Ram Cummins, we've seen shutdown of communication. So just to give you a headlight that I've been teaching for a while on the 6.7, we understand the communication, oh, go back, takes place all on 6 and 14. This is network. So there you can see on the diagram right there, there's your 6 and 14 down here. Okay, hopefully you can see my cursor. So we see 14 and 6. You'll notice it immediately spits, splits off, spit, not splits off, sorry. There's E and F circuit, and then you see the A and B circuit. Let's just keep going here. We'll follow A and B. It continues on. You're going to notice is the twisted pair of wires. That's what this symbol rec, uh, represents. And in this case, you can see all the splices in between and all the modules that I'm, I'm not even showing all of them right there, but you see the modules all talking on that same network. Always think about something. As you see these wires, just ground one of them. If one is grounded, guess what it did to the network? It just shut it down. So in this case, it continues on with JK. And if we follow JK on the left, you're going to see it eventually comes into the diesel application. And there's your ECM right there, or PCM right there, as we like to call it. And then you got a separate CAN circuit that goes to the glow plug control module. And to see it better, there's your NOx sensors as well. So have we had issues where we've had a shorted NOx sensor shutting down communication? Yes. So it is just a means of you having to understand how to basically check a network. Because in the past, we've had crazy problems. Here's an oldie but a goodie on a 6.7, you know, where we had network connection problems. But then we had a shorted, and this one had a shorted uh, harness here. So in this case, we had a wrench light. We had no crank, no start. I mean, the network problems can be really fun. And in this case, the problem was a shorted Injector, and what was weird about this, not a short injector, excuse me, a shorted injector harness. 
But what was interesting is this one actually was shutting down the computer and not letting it actually stay with the program. So every time I logged into it with the key on, it actually would say it needed an update program. So I would reflash it and program it. And then after cycling the key on and off, guess what? It would tell me again that it was blank. So I kept trying to update it and sure turns out that there was an issue with the network, especially with a shorted injector. So it was back feeding back to the computer, shutting it down. That's why we're saying on six O's and six, seven power strokes, if you ever find yourself with no communication, simply disconnect the middle connector, which is the engine connector. So if there's a short in that engine harness, just take it off and let's see if that is the cause of, it's, it isn't the only one, but it's the more popular cause of the network not communicating. So therefore, pull that middle connector off. But if you didn't ever know, simple 101 basics on CAN communication, almost every truck out there at pin 6 and 14. You connect 14 to ground the meter, and it should read an average of somewhere around 2.5 volts with key on engine off. So in this case, if you don't see two and a half volts, that means that network is dead. You're like, whoa, 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 you lost me, Tony. You connect the scan tool, no communication. So nothing's happening. Is it a bad computer? Doubt, I doubt it. But in this case, it's a good idea to, let's see if it's chatting, turn the key on, put your meter, 14 to ground, and then six to ground. It should read two and a half volts average. If it's 2.1 to 2.6, 2.7, don't get sweated. It's long. That's telling me it's turning on and off because can communication toggles between zero and five volts. So in this case, the average voltage that the meter could read is about two and a half volts. Quick check you can do. Hey, is this computer chatting? And that's what you're looking at. So as you're working with the 6.7, the primary water pump has been starting to see a lot of failures. We see the vacuum pump leaking oil, and you probably have dreaded the oil pan leakage. You're going buck crazy with the sealer. Make sure it never leaks again because there have been guys that have sealed it and it still leaks. Always remember something, though, especially when you're dealing with oil leaks. This engine could have some serious crankcase pressure, blow-by. That could be your problem causing the oil leak. So don't forget about blow-by and crankcase pressure. And when you're working with cylinders, always remember Ford went different. Ford said, hey, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, that's the way they number their cylinders, so know how they work. But then again, on these six sevens, you can have an oil pressure indication on the dash. This is becoming more common. We're starting to see these a little more frequently. Not chronic, but it's starting to happen. Or the, well, the truck's running. I don't hear no knocking. So even though it says on the dash display oil pressure low, it's probably an oil pressure switch problem. But do yourself a favor. They could leak just like the old ones on the 6.4s and 6.0s. So do your customer a favor, favor, sell them the oil pressure switch along with the oil temperature sensor, please. And remember, there are two cooling systems on these 6.7s. You know, you got your primary cooling system and you got your secondary cooling system along with the charge air cooler. So in this case, that charge air cooler is doing a lot of work. So therefore it is liquid cooled, sorry. There's your liquid cool charger cooler. So now why am I telling you that? Because it isn't surprising now we're starting to find a few leak because a lot of guys are not following the manufacturer's recommendation from Ford on when to test the cooling. So therefore, you know, in this case, cooling check, initial 60,000 miles or 2,400 hours, so subsequently every 45,000 miles or 1,800 engine hours and check it every 15,000. So a lot of guys are not doing the flush. They're not doing the coolant nitrate check. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. So in this case, if you haven't bought the kit there, which is made by AccuStrip, you know, you're supposed to be testing that coolant on those trucks appropriately. So definitely do your testing. There you go. But then we got the early model. The later model EGR coolers are not carbon fouling as much. Uh, you probably know about the EGR flow codes you can get, EGR issues. A lot of it has to do with suit accumulation on these coolers themselves. Be aware that the later models, what is it, 2016 and later, they went to a different style, tube style EGR cooler, which doesn't prone to clog as much. So therefore, be aware of that. But here's a company called Hydrozone that I highly recommend. Uh, these guys, we use it for other stuff too. It's an EGR cooler cleaner. It's a uh, hydro, what do you call it? Um, it, it's water-based, meaning that it's hydro, what's the word I'm looking for? 
but anyways, it's it, in other words, it's 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 pretty friendly. It's not going to hazardous. It's not hazardous cleaner, but it does an amazing. In other words, I'll take an EGR cooler and I'll put this mix of the EGR cooler cleaner in into a five gallon bucket. Next morning, it's clean as a whistle. It's amazing how it breaks down that hard soot that's in it. So I highly recommend that EGR cooler cleaner. But one thing you got to look out for, this is the intake from the air cleaner. On the other side here, which I don't have a good picture of, is your intake coming out from the charge air cooler. Check that for excessive carbon accumulation when you got EGR flow codes or any kind of drivability issue. So if the truck has easily high mileage, it's a good idea to take that tube off coming off of that charge air cooler back into the intake because that could be full of carbon. So then be careful not to let chunks go into the intake and the engine will swallow them, could hurt the engine itself. So... But always remember, with NOx reduction, those EGR coolers are needed to actually reduce. So one of the things you're going to follow as you command an EGR to open, you're going to look at the rate of mass airflow change there. So it's important you understand that I'm supposed to, again, see a change or reduction in mass airflow when I open the EGRs as you're checking your flow. But this is all outlined in the pinpoint is that you should be checking. So, so at this time, what can you do for the vehicle owner? Service it. I mean, change the oil. I got a truck right now, another customer, 2013, another 2013, that has a lot of blow-by. So in this case, we're trying to address that blow-by because he's already getting premature uh, suit accumulation every 2,000 miles of that DPF. And a lot has to do with that blow-by gases. Because when you look at, always remember, when you're looking at blow-by gases at idle, that's the blow-by gas you're getting at idle. Now, put 25 pounds of boost on this engine under a load pulling a heavy trailer how much you know crankcase gases or blow by are you seeing now so when you look at it idle you take the old cap off and you see the blow by that's the blow by at idle again how much is it under load it is some serious blow by and that carries a lot of oil with it and be recirculated and again cause premature suit accumulation on a dpf and ash accumulation on a dpf for the life of the CP4 and the injectors, fuel filter is very critical. And anytime you look at the truck for any kind of service, it's a good idea to evaluate the suit load. Maybe I can run a regeneration so that truck is not running any active regenerations while it's going down the road. So it's very important to do that. And perform your coolant testing when you're supposed to and ensure the death fluid being used is certified. They should be using it, but just understand and train the customer, educate them about what these emission systems are and how they look. It could be as easy as me showing them an animation off of YouTube, showing them how the, you know, the actual, uh, you know, the the animation of how the injector is injecting death fluid into the exhaust. You got a whole bunch on YouTube. Come on. You can explain that to the customer real quickly. But know your common area. Like we said, contamination is the worst enemy. There are tests that the scan tool can do. Like, for example, when I do a high pressure test using my IDS scan to want a Ford product, you know, you're going to see that, hey, I can see, do a ramp up test. Yes, this is nice as you're going to see it, but understand this is under no load. So, therefore, you're not simulating loaded conditions. So, can we pass this test, but yet fail uh, low rail pressure under a load? The answer is yes. So, in this case, please note. It is a wise idea to monitor your actual rail pressure while you're under a load there. So therefore, monitor desired and actual commanded versus measured pressure while you're test driving down the road. And that's what you're looking at there. So make sense? Hopefully that is helping you there. Make sure you do that. Very important. So I know there's been a lot of you that have been changing over to CP3, to CP4, especially on the Duramax applications. Remember, the CP3 has three plungers. The CP4 has four plungers, excuse me, two plungers, but it strokes twice per every rotation. So therefore, that means the CP4 strokes four times, while the CP3 strokes three times. So in this case, um, you're kind of taking some performance out of it, especially under heavy loads. Yes, you're probably going to get better life, but it all depends. Because like I said, we got some CP4s that are going a long life that are serviced appropriately. So be aware of that. And there you can see in this picture, if you look very closely, there are two cams on the center camshaft here or the center lobe here of the CP4 pump. So that means it strokes not one, but twice. These two plungers giving us a total of four strokes of displacement coming out of the CP4. 
should know the components on these uh, power stroke 6.7s, but the number one guy I go after for contamination is I like to take off this guy, which is the pressure control valve. Service information now gives us a spec for how much return we're supposed to have out of this guy, but I like to remove it to check to see if it has any what, any leakage, and that's what we're looking at. And in case you haven't learned a common rule, which you should take a course on that is, you should understand that you got some kind of PCV pressure control valve on the injection pump, and then you got some kind of, excuse me, rephrase. You have a pressure control valve, which is high pressure control valve on the rail, and you got a volume control valve on the injection pump. It's got different names from different companies, I understand, but in this case, that's the general name we like to use. So they work together to provide that rail pressure you need. But it doesn't substitute the fact that when you look at like on a Ford product, you can have this beautiful power balance graph. And when you look at this power balance graph, you're going to be able to kill one cylinder at a time. And what I like about it on IDS is I can see the actual performance of each cylinder and the signature leads to see if they're all dropping evenly. Are they all dropping evenly? That's the nice thing about it. But here's a trivia question that you could ask yourself is, I can see that I see valleys when I have a miss. Here you can see I'm killing number four, for example. So in this case, I could see the valleys where I drop. But what about when I see some mountains? If I see mountains being built, that's telling me that cylinder is probably overfueling, which means you got a leaky injector. So be aware that you're not only looking for how well that each cylinder is working and what it drops, but also if you are idling and you see mountains there, that's a possible indication that cylinder is overpowering the rest and it's probably overfueling there. So you need to know that too as well. You probably know injectors on these 6.7s or piezo. Like I said, we've seen some interesting stuff on them. You should know their operation where the piezo stack is pushing down on a dual uh, piston arrangement, which creates the pressure to unlock, or shall we say, push down on the control valve and cause injection to occur. Regardless, when I look at this picture and I look at all these little, you know, passages, I'm like, cleanliness is more important than ever. So in this case, cleanliness. I like to use a different product. There's some that are sold by different manufacturers from Alliant Power to Standardine to, you know, to uh, BG. I like the BG245 because we actually keep the system clean to keep it all clean. But always remember, these are IQA coded, so make sure you program those injectors appropriately. If not, you're not going to be running at its optimum levels. But know the system, how it works. For example, this is an older system. I could tell you by looking at this picture because the newer systems have three tubes coming out of the filter. Yes, there's a third tube now. So if you haven't been paying attention how these are routed, well, you're going to learn it. So therefore, that has changed for the 2020 and later model year. Not to mention the return system tests that you can do that are very important to understand. Like I said, something as frivolous as the fuel filters. There's an update change. You can see that on the later models, we went to the flat style filter. And again, there's your three, uh, should I say three discharge, three tube filter on the right-hand side there that you're seeing. But you know what? It's funny. I can't tell you how many consumers are do-it-yourselfers and you're supposed to line up an edge right there on that fuel filter housing right there. There you can see the big, what is it? 34, 36 millimeter socket you put on the bottom to rotate it. And guys, never line up those notches. You're supposed to line up those notches. That's when you know you're in all the way. And that could lead to, you know, false lift pump pressure problems because the lift pump pressure is on the center of it. So you got to know how to service it, whether you drain on the left, whether you spin and drain to on the right. Something as silly as fuel filter, like I said, service is very important. I have a YouTube video on my channel where I talk about where air can get trapped here. And it's funny. I must have gotten who knows how many comments of people thanking me on YouTube how they got that problem where they got air trapped in there, and that's why they had low lift pump pressure. So again, tricks that you need to understand and know because the pump is only as good as the air in, that's not in it, you know, and there should be no air in the system and it could get trapped on that secondary fuel filter. So you gotta just unhook the line and bleed it out because this pump can move up to 120 PSI, even though it averages around 58 to 59 PSI, and it has a 10 micron filter inside of it, so. But things have changed. Early systems, what do we see? We had an inertia switch. You should know about inertia switch on a Ford product. The inertia switch was there to actually protect the system from fuel in case of an accident. That would shut down power to fuel pumps. Sometimes they would just trigger, so all you had to do was push the button on an inertia switch, right? 
And we saw the fuel system, how it basically worked, but things have changed a lot because now on the power stroke 6.7, you'll see that the whole pump is now in the tank. So in this case, you can see that the pump's in the tank and they're using a fuel pump control module. Same specs, 120 PSI, it's capable of, but what you're going to see now as you look at the wiring diagram is you're going to see that, you know, you got now the fuel pump sender unit and you got also the wiring going to this guy on the far right, as you can see there, that is your fuel pump control module. We already dealt with this on a narrow frame truck and turns out we had a bad ground going to the fuel pump control module. But just understand now that the fuel pump control module is sending feedback over to the PCM. So therefore that all works concurrently along with the relay. But again, the fuel pump control module is in play now. So a lot going on right there. So be aware of that. In the past, we had the fuel temperature sensor, the fuel pressure switch right there on the low pressure line going towards the injection pump. That was nice to have. Now they merged them together as one for a while now. So it's a two and one sensor. So instead of two, you're going to see one sensor that houses both the fuel temp and the fuel pressure switch. So you're going to see definitely that. But remember, that fuel pressure switch is there in case, again, the fuel lift pump pressure is low. So that will trigger a message on dash. So you know your systems there. So there you go. Last but not least, real quickly here is your fuel trims. A lot of chatter about, you know, with the fuel trims on a Ford. As you can see here, I'm looking at fuel trims on a 6.7 model. And in this case, you're asking yourself, okay, I see these changes in micrograms. Yeah, they're very small changes, guys. Very small changes. So in this case, what you're going to look for is an average of no more than two grams is what we're looking at. And you'll notice that this is a good running engine right here. So you're saying, well, Tony, once you know, 665 micrograms versus 835 micrograms, which is 305. That's still in the window because it's a very finite, very small test. So if I see one sticking out close to four milligrams or two milligrams, that definitely is a problem injector and you would address. But you know what? We have seen fuel trim problems being resolved by running cleaners or some kind of fuel treatment in the actual engine itself to clean up the injectors. That has been very good to work with us, but it could also mean that we may have some issues going on with the injection system. So know your values and know what you're looking for on these trucks as you move along. All righty. So that takes me pretty much to time. Mr. David, are you out there? I am out there. Yes, I'm here. Tony, thank you very much. That was super informative. Um, just a couple of comments here. I, I like the, the portion there when you're doing the balance tests. And you were talking about the valleys, you know, and, you know, cylinder cutouts and so forth. But I really like the point there about the mountains. I mean, that's super yeah. important to be able to see that without having to take injectors out and test the injectors and see if they're leaking or, you know, uh, worn or whatever the case may be. The mountains are super important. Yeah. The other thing, one, of the, I, sorry, go ahead. one of the key things, if you don't mind me saying, that's why I forgot to pull this slide up. I put this as a, is today's day and age with all the complaints we've been getting, it, this is becoming now essential. Diesel Craft, they used to have one for accuracy, but Diesel Craft is about the only company right now I could find that's now testing DEF fluid and diesel. We were talking about DEF and diesel, but now we're seeing that there's a lot more DEF in diesel than what we've seen before addressing injector issues. So to me, this is becoming like a must have tool because you don't know if the driver or the consumer is also lying to you about whether they had an oops where they put DEF fluid in the diesel tank. So thought I right. mentioned this, this has become the latest and greatest thing here, so. Good, good. The other uh, takeaway that I, I liked very much was the point uh, of the uh, oil pan leaks. Meaning to say, we've all experienced oil pan leaks. And as you say, you know, you put a new gasket on and then you fill it full of the gunk, you know, to try and seal it. And lo and behold, you know, a few days later, a month later, it's still leaking, you know. And, um, you know, the, the point there with um, the high crankcase uh, pressure, you know, is super important. There is something that like you think to yourself, wow, I didn't even think about that one, you know. So those are my two takeaways there. But uh, some of the questions that we have just real briefly, because we have just a short period of time for questions is uh, somebody writes here, it says, Tony, I get around 14 miles per gallon uh, with a boat behind it. I'm not sure if the person's asking, is that good or bad? What, what, what do you take That's on that? That's actually pretty good. 
actually is pretty yeah. good considering the driving happens. That's pretty good, actually, 14 miles per gallon. You know, it isn't surprising to see 12, 14, maybe 16. But yes. it all depends how you drive it, too, as well. But, yeah, 14 right. is not bad at all. Good. Uh, the next question I have here is, is, what's the spec for crankcase pressure on a 6.7 power stroke for idle pressure compared to under load pressure? Ooh, that we haven't done yet because Ford initially gave us big, but, you know, we can compare it to a Duramax where they were calling for 16 inches of water pressure at 3,000 RPM. So I would say somewhere around 12 to 16 inches at idle, but mm -hmm. I don't have a spec for under a load, though. Okay. All right. Thank you. The other question we have here, it says, uh, are vehicles uh, getting more complicated or is it just more more components on there? Is it really getting more complicated? Both. I would say both. both. Okay. But our job is to understand it and learn it. Whether it becomes complicated or not, the level of complication would determine how much you know of it. Like I mentioned with that LMT, you got that gateway module. And that gateway module has got some serious wiring going all over the place. And it's kind of weird, yeah. unlike CAN communication. So I say, yeah, you can say it's complicated, but at the same time, we have to step up to the plane and meet up to that technology. Okay. Um, another question here, you, you, you mentioned the quick serve mobile, you know, that Cummins is offering. Is that a free download, a free app? Okay. Yes. That is how much app. information can you get can you get out of that? In other words, you know, say, say you subscribe to Cummins's, um, uh, you know, their, their, quick their serve, system. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does this one, is this limited to just a little bit of information or not? Yeah, because you, uh, first of all, it's a Cummins engine, but it yet is a Ram Dodge FCA uh, network system. So you're only going to get so much when it comes to the Cummins mechanical aspect of it. So sure. you still... Okay, very good. Um, I understand it. It's a Cummins engine, but yet it is in a, you know, a, a Dodge FCA body. Sure. Um, the other question here that, that somebody posted, it's uh, is with regards to your diagnostic strategy and you say the one, two, three. Um, do you have somewhere something or is there somewhere that one can go and say, you know, I, I remember some of your classes that I've attended to before. And the first thing you ever taught that, that really stuck with me is you open the hood, the first thing you're gonna look at is look at the battery, right? That battery um, filters and so on, yeah. Yeah, and so forth. Is there some things, you know, when you talk about a strategy, is there something that that's, that's uh, you know, line by line by line, in other words- Yes, actually, Ford in their pinpoint test has them. Uh, okay. Dodge has their system. They put out a after treatment one for after treatment issues that they put out a whole, this whole package. And so did uh, Duramax. Duramax GM has always had strategy-based diagnostics under diagnostic starting point. Okay. So the answer is yes, every manufacturer. And if you need help, you're welcome to email me at tsalis at dieseltg.com and I will send you a link where that is found. Uh, yeah, that's important. Very, I'm glad you asked that question because sometimes we need guidance, but common sense, open the hood. Yes, very important. Like I said, you don't want to be doing regenerations and turns out, like I said earlier, you got a clogged air filter. Sure. Uh, the other question I have here is, how do you sell diagnostic time? In other words, do you find, you know, custom, customers are really reluctant to, to, to pay oh, yeah. for that? Or do they understand that these days? The quickest answer I can give you is, number one is communication. And number two is like uh, like our all our scandals, like my Snap-on Verus, I can print stuff stuff off. So when I give them something tangible, that makes it an easier sale for for diagnostics. Because before it was just oh we found this, we found this, and that's all you're getting is a verbal. When they you show them numbers and graphs, even though they don't know what it means, it gives them comfort to say hey you did some homework, and it makes the diagnostics sell a lot easier. So in this case, yeah, some diagnostics can go into three to four to six hours, you know, and then at that point, we should be in, in, into the vehicle knowing what's going on. But communication and tell, tell them, hey, this is what I need to do. Time is money. And the joke I tell customers, is, you know, I got a problem with my techs is that they don't like to work for free. Right. So, so we do tell them that. But yeah, communication and uh, giving them s some kind of report does help in your selling the diagnostic further. Because let's face point. it, there's some trucks that are going to take more time. So, Sure. Very, very good point. Somebody else writes here, there is a bunch of crank no-start checklists for Ford and Duramax. So yes, there are. You know, that's something to look out for. Um, yes. The other one, last but not least, uh, you mentioned something about... 
No, I think that was that was it. Um, okay. I think that's about it, Tony. So okay. if you don't mind me saying on this slide, this is sure. my newest credo now, my latest line is, so here's the deal, up front and real. You won't train, some of you, and you think you're going to learn everything in an hour. Listen, learn, and maybe you're one of those that will sit in the vehicle with a scandal and think that there is repair and just clearing the codes and have the vehicle go away. Ah. You are dealing with D-RAID and something is not easy to repair. So if you will replace a complete fuel system without proper diagnosis and blame faulty parts, this has happened. So I guess what I'm trying to say is your parts replacers, you can't get away with it like you used to before because simple fact that how much does it cost and it didn't fix it. So again, the truth is you need to get up to date and train and continue to train. So sure. there, that's my credo. Great. Well, with that, uh, I'd like to wind up things. Uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, Tony. Thank you very much for that great presentation. And as Tony is putting up here, if anybody has any additional questions, you want to sign up uh, to be on our mailing list so that you receive all these notices. Uh, just as a, by the way, we're going to have uh, in October, November, and December, we're going to have three more uh, webinars, different subjects, and we'll be announcing those in the very near future. But if you're not on our mailing list and want to be on our mailing list, you know, either send me an email, give me a call, send me a message, something like this. Or if not, our sales manager in our uh, Detroit office, Erica Ricardo, uh, she can help you out as well. Either one of us can help you out so that... Um, you know, you can be up to date on everything that's happening at uh, Lucas Diesel Systems. And I would like to thank everybody for your uh, participation here this afternoon. Uh, I think it's been extremely interesting. And as I say, we're going to have some more classes. Uh, please check out our website also. Our website is lucasdiesel.com. It has a lot of information on there. And so do our, um, our Instagram, our Facebook page, Twitter, YouTube. All those um, uh, systems have a lot of information with regards to what's coming up in the very near future. Um, we're also going to be at uh, Apex. Uh, Lucas is going to have a booth at Apex as well as at ADS Lent HDAW. We're going to have a booth out there. So be sure to stop by, say hi, and see what's new. We've got a lot of new items, new products coming along, new services coming along. So please uh, come say hi and see what's new at, uh, at Lucas. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much once again to everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next month on the next uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.